and I ask you, you have you ever heard, seen a, a drill sergeant cry? Have you ever seen a drill sergeant cry in front of you? Ever happened before? These are tough people, okay? successful, uh, but we know you've paid close attention and, and uh, the plaintiffs thank you for that. But this is what's called the closing argument, okay? Uh, but I don't really think I'm going to be doing a lot of arguing, uh, because when you have a case that involves rocket fuel and bottled water, there's not a lot of things you have to argue about. Uh, what I think I'm going to try to do instead is show you some of the highlights of the trial and try to explain how it they, it, the highlights fit into some of the jury instructions in the verdict form. The verdict form is what you're going to be given at the very end of the case. This is the document that you have to fill out. Okay? And it's called special verdict form, but there's just one. There's just the verdict form. And Shane, why don't we go through it real slowly just so the jury can see what they're going to be asked to do. Okay, again, Real Water has admitted that they're liable. They've admitted that the product caused the injuries in this case. The court determines that Han is liable. So the first question that you're going to have is question number two. Did Milwaukee fail to provide an adequate warning? That's the very first thing you're going to have to decide when you go back there. And there's just two choices here, yes or no. Okay, next, up a little bit, Shane. So since we have seven plaintiffs, you have to answer the, the second one uh, separately for each one. <coughs> Was the substantial factor in causing the injury to each one of the plaintiffs? Answers should be yes. We, we contend uh, that they're, they're separately on the form because, again, we have seven separate plaintiffs. Next one, Shane, please. This is for, this is the other liability theory against Milwaukee. Remember, the judge just told you there's two different theories. So the second one is, did they breach the implied warranty of fitness for a particular purpose? I'm going to get into that. And again, you have to answer yes or no on this one. Uh, next one, Shane. This is the same, the same uh, uh, substantial factor causing, but this one, the same as the warning one, but this one is for the second theory. Okay, same. And again, once again, we have to put all seven plaintiffs on there. Next one, Shane, move up, please. So then we get into each one of the plaintiffs, what the appropriate damages amount for them. We start with the Ryan, the baby, then we go to Camille, <coughs> go up, go, then that's Camille, husband, Brian, up, up, Shane. So then you got to do Mr. Haley, Mr. Bautiz, next one. And you have to do all these because, like I've said already, Real Water has admitted liability and uh, Han has been determined to be liable. So you're going to have to fill all these out. Uh, go ahead to the very bottom. So then the last three questions are each one of the defendants liable for punitive damages. Those are the final three questions. Uh, and then you're done. So it's pretty quick. Twenty. It says 20 questions, but it's really not that complicated and very important. Um, I filled it out pretty fast myself. I, I tried myself just to, to look for any problems. All right, so. I said that Real Water and Hannah have admitted to liability. Milwaukee has not admitted to liability. Uh, and that's the reason we have the two liability questions for them. That's the reason we have the punitive question for them. So I want to start now with what Real Water hasn't admitted. They haven't admitted that they're liable for punitive damages. So, excuse me. 
in this. Okay. Okay. Punitive misconduct again. This is the yes no. All right, Shane. Next. These are the reasons we contend that real water is liable for punitive damages. Four different reasons. First one is they did no testing, no testing whatsoever on this product before they released it to the public. And this product was made using a bizarre manufacturing uh, process. You know, I called it juice, juice, mix, test. You know, but we'll get into that a little bit. That's point one. Point two, they hired unqualified people. We're going to talk about Ms. Converse, the receptionist that they immediately made the quality control director. And when they had qualified people, like Mr. Desito and Mr. Pham, they fired them when they tried to fix the problems. That's the second reason they're liable for punitives. Third one, the NSF audit. Again, NSF is a third-party testing entity. So NSF came in, inspected the facility, flunked them, flunked them on this third-party audit. We'll look at that in a little more detail here in a second. Uh, but they didn't make any changes. They continued the, core bo the, the poor bottling practices. Fourth one, they didn't investigate these complaints. Okay, remember, this is where we started the case. I showed you all these complaints that had been uh, made by a number of different people. We actually brought uh, Mr. Watkins. He testified here live. I presented video testimony by three or four of the other ones. But what happened after all this? No investigation whatsoever. They send everyone free water. Okay, so for any one of those four reasons, we think they should be liable for punitive damages. So let's start with the first one, no product testing. And again, next slide, please. This is a bizarre manufacturing process. I don't think we need to go through it in detail again, but first they juice the water, then they juice it again, then they mix it. That's how they make the concentrate. Then they mix the concentrate with more purified water, and that's when they use the orb meter. Um, this was a brand new product. It was made using these titanium tubes that you see. This was the creation of someone named John Marlowe, who we brought you to this, we brought to the stand. And if you recall, Mr. Marlowe said he came up with this in his garage. He tested it on himself. Okay, he drank it and changed it, and if he didn't throw up that day, that was better formulation. That's how this product was tested. Uh, in a garage by one person. And then, Mr. Marlowe, you know, was he some vice president of Nestle or someone who had a lot of experience making real water? No. <laughs> he was someone who went to school to be an architect, admitted he flunked chemistry, stumbled onto these titanium tubes, bought them from some gentleman who, I'm, I'm, you, know, you know, you just can't make this kind of stuff up. Um, and the titanium tubes, to electrify the water, they would hook up these battery uh, jumpers, the ones on the right. Those are the actual ones. They'd hook them up to the tube, and they'd electrify by it twice. Twice they would do it. You know, it's kind of like when Dr. Frankenstein, you know, he, he hooked up his electrical charges to dead body parts. They did it to real water. And they did it just like Dr. Frankenstein did it. In secret, it was all secret in a secret concentrate room. They didn't even let the uh, quality assurance directors in there, didn't tell anybody what they were using. Uh, but this is a strange way to make a product. So you would think, you would think that if you're going to make the product like this, that you would at least test it, right? So, and they should do tests. They should test brand new products. And what did they tell you? What did uh, we hear about how uh, much it would cost to test? Well, that came uh, on Friday. <coughs> this is Dr. Babcock. He's one of their witnesses. He's not my witness. He was one of their experts. He's a chemist hired by defendants. He uh, testified that real water should have tested his product. I don't think that's in dispute. Uh, he said that this, there's a standard. He called it a mass spectrometry. Uh, there were a couple other letters in there in front of it, but they could have tested it, and if they had done that, that just doesn't test for hydrazine, okay? That's just a standard across-the-board test that they look for hundreds, if not thousands, of potential contaminants. 
So if you've done a mass spectrometry, you would have found the hydrogen. Dr. Babcock told you this. And how much does that cost to do a mass spectrometry? $100. $100 is what it would have cost to test this product if you did. $100. They didn't do it. Uh, and we contend that the failure to test is the first reason why they were responsible for punitive damages. But don't take my word for it. Let's, let's, let's see what Dr. Babcock said. Shane, can I first, Dr. Babcock? You also discussed some instruments that are used when you want to detect hydrogen or these other potential um, contaminants in, in water. I believe you said uh, GCMS with mass spectrometry and LCMS with mass spectrometry. Is that correct? Yes. Next one, Shane. So for one or two hundred dollars when your water was first about to introduce the product to the market and kind of sent it out for testing and wondering if, if hydrogen or any number of contaminants were in the product, correct? Yes. And if they had been receiving uh, complaints of illnesses or liver injuries or uh, chemical smells or fishy smells at any time they could have just sent a sample to a lab to run these types of tests for less than two hundred dollars. And these are not big machines like superconductors that are only found or super colliders that are only found in Switzerland. This this guy had one in his own lab. Okay? So for hundred dollars they could have they could have done this test, they didn't do it. And we think that's the first reason they're liable for Punitive damages. The second one, <coughs> they hired unqualified people, they fired the qualified employees. All right, let's have my next slide. These are the three people. Okay, we start out with the receptionist, Patty Converse, they make her the quality control director six weeks. Only six weeks after she's been the receptionist. Boom, she's the quality control director. And she's the quality control director for a long period of time, 27 months, all right? 27 months. And then we have Mr. Uh, Desital, the vet. Okay, he was, uh, I think it was Army. But he was quality control director. He got hired at the end of 2017. And I'm going to play the testimony for you in a minute. He got fed up and left. Okay, and then we had someone who is a professional. He's been the quality control director. Remember, he was at some place in San Francisco and a couple others. That was Tom Pham. He also quit when he tried to fix things and they wouldn't let him do it. All right, so these are the three key people. The first one's not qualified at all. The second two were qualified, but when they tried to fix things, they fired them. They got rid of them. All right, let's go to the first one, Shane. So she's the receptionist, promoted to quality control in six weeks. No experience whatsoever in making bottled water. No experience whatsoever in quality control. You know, when we took her deposition, she Point blank admitted she wasn't qualified. And we asked her about these customer complaints. And again, for 27 months, the way she handled the customer complaints is she sent them free water. No investigation whatsoever, just give them some free water. And uh, she also said that the ore meter didn't work properly. I'm going to explain, or I'm going to play that part for you a little bit, maybe not today. Uh, but this was the first person, not qualified. Okay, next thing. And we would agree with me that if there was a water processing plant and you had record quality control and there were things going on in some room that you had no access to, you could ensure the total integrity of the system. Correct. I do know that. And now that you say that, I know right. that, but I didn't have the, that kind of background. Okay. You didn't have the training to recognize that at the time. Correct. Okay. Apparently, nice woman, but she didn't have the background or the training to be the director of quality control. Now we get to Mr. Desitel. Okay, three problems. They held him out as the director of quality control, but they didn't tell him that. He thought he was the production person. Didn't tell him about any of these prior incidences. Didn't tell him about any of them, not one of them. And if he had known about them, he would have stopped the line. He would have done the right thing, okay? So let's start with what Mr. Desitel said about 
how he thought they were running the business. Okay. So did you approve of the way in general they were doing the business? No, no, I'm not. Um, from the from the very top, the owner, um, Blaine, the way they ran was uh, haphazard, not in control. Um, there weren't steady procedures that were that were set in place. To my knowledge, there was never any procedure set in place. The whole drive for the day was get as much out the door as you can and as fast as you can. And to make as much money as you can, basically. Trying to make as much product as possible, get it out the door, make as much money, profits over safety. Classic example. Okay. And then, Mr. Desotel, remember he's 20 year, I think it was Army. <laughs> and then he had experience in six or seven other places. So he knew what he was doing. Okay. So he tried to fix some things. And so what happened when he even tried to put the most basic safety procedure in? This is what happened. We got to clean up, we got to stop what we're doing, or someone's going to get hurt for safety, or the product's going to get contaminated. So you're going to make the call. No one likes the call. So I made the call to stop the line and get it cleaned up. I was overruled because of production. The other as is, move on. So. Basically, what I did is I walked around and picked up stuff. I did it myself. Parts of it, you know, the best I could. But we really need to clean and mop everything and make sure it's straight. But I couldn't do it. We killed it with that. I was taught to. Um, I, I eventually quit. I walked out. I, I couldn't take it anymore. Tried to fix things, got rid of. Okay? Okay. And again, just to remind you who the three quality control directors were. We started with receptions, we went to Mr. Gestel, and now we got to Mr. Pham, who had quite a bit of experience, all right? Mr. Pham told you that he got fired. He got fired because he was trying to fix problems. Mr. Pham, please. You think you were fired because you wanted to impose quality control measures like HACCP, and they wouldn't let you do it. <laughs> They let me do to a certain point to where when I started asking more questions about ingredients, and that was it. That, that's what my belief was. Wants to know what's in the product he's selling. That's a pretty simple question, right? What's in this product we're selling? Okay, you're fired. That's what happened. And that's why we think they're responsible for punitive damages. And there's no dispute that to do adequate quality control you have to know what's in the product. Even Mrs. Congress knew that. And that's what Shane. So with regards to your job as the director of quality control, you could not do any quality control in the conflict room because you didn't know what was going on there. Exactly. Okay. Okay. Second reason they're liable for punitive damages, unqualified people, they fired the qualified ones. Third one, we get to the NSF audit. So in December, Costco has NSF come in here, but Costco wants, you know, this is a Costco. Costco was the one that commissioned this. They send NSF in. NSF goes in on December 6, 2018, and this is what they find. This is the HACCP portion. You remember HACCP, it's a big word, it just means quality control, more or less. So HACCP. These are the standard HACCP questions on the NSF audit. So if you get a yes, that's good. If you get a no, you fail. So first one, no. Second one, no. Third one, yes. OK, they got one. Fourth one, no. Fifth one, no. Sixth one, the flow diagram. Remember Mr. Fam told you about that? He wanted a flow diagram? No. Uh, has you did, have you done a hazard analysis of all the things? Well, how can you do that when you don't know what's in the product? That's a no. Next one. These are not applicable. So there's there's a standard ones. Now we go to 12. No. Okay. 13. No. 14. No. So out of 10 questions that were answered, they flunked. Nine of them. They got one out of 10 right. 10% right. And they're making bottled water that was sold throughout our county. One out of ten, right? They're making bottled water. So this isn't something that 
you know, just Costco got. This is something that Real Water got. They had to sign off on this. So they knew that they had a problem. And the next one from this, Shane, can you show the next one? This is a specific finding in the HACCP report. Quote, there was no qualified individual to provide a level of competency necessary for production of clean and safe product. Note that the QA director had resigned. That was apparently Mr. Desitel who resigned. Okay, so there's no one there that knows how to make clean and safe product. There's no one at the entire facility that knows how to make clean product. What more damning finding could you have if you're trying to sell a bottled water product? So they flunked this test, and everything went on as before. They continued all the practices. Um, And there's no way to sugarcoat this result, okay? There's no way to say, oh, we, at least we got one right. Here's what Mr. Pham said. And again, he's a professional. This is what he said about this audit. So back, back to this NSF audit that we have is uh, 18. This is pretty poor audit result for a company. I believe so. I never had to come in and, and sell so many demerits. Um, is this, is this one of the worst or the worst you've ever seen? Yes, uh -huh. that's the worst. Worst audit he's ever seen. And he's seen a lot of them, okay? Like I keep saying, he was a professional. So they get this terrible audit, and you know, maybe, maybe this is the time to spend $100 and test the product. Didn't do that. Um, was it a secret? Was it a secret that this was a substandard operation? I don't think so. This is what Mr. Desso told you. Was it a substandard operation? Yes. Okay. Okay, since we can only work for what, six to eight places? Yes. How many people are you in the water? Negative one. It's a negative one. It's the worst place I've ever worked in my entire life. Why is that? Because of the structure that was put forth in, in, in within that company, they, you know, the first week I was there, I was looking for another job, and it took me a while to find one, of course. But it's just the way it was ran, the way the the people that ran it cared about the folks that worked there was non-existent. It was mostly give me what I want, when I want, and to produce the make line. Second time, he said the exact same thing. They were just trying to make money. But the more important point, on a scale of 1 to 10, what did he rate this? Negative 1? On a scale of 1 to 10, he rates it a negative 1? The worst audit Mr. Pham has ever seen? So that's the third reason they're liable for punitive damages. NSF came in, told them about the problems. They didn't do anything. And this is the one that really upsets me for some reason. So we have these prior instances. Remember at the opening, I showed you all these prior instances, and I told you we'd bring in testimony of these people, okay? And, and remember I showed you the Southern Valley Health District chart of the symptoms of uh, acute liver failure? And we see the same things here with all these people, okay? Vomiting, diarrhea, memory problems, because you've got encephalopathy. Maybe we get it right sooner or later. Uh, you know, didn't even investigate these, okay? Did not even investigate these, including three different people that went into the hospital in 2018 and 2019 with acute liver failure. So we brought you these people because it's important. When you get a customer complaint, you should investigate it. You know, even if it's an established product, much less one made through this bizarre manufacturing technique, you should investigate it. Here's the first person we brought in, Mrs. Kessler, I believe. Is the first. Okay. What happened to your liver enzymes after you stopped drinking real water? My liver enzymes have gone down to normal now. This is January 2016, she wrote them a complaint, told them about the bitter taste. 
that she got elevated liver enzymes. January 2016. That was, what, seven, seven and a half years ago? Okay, next one. This is Mrs. Dorn. She made two complaints because she, first she got sick, and then her parents were busy. Or she, were you and Mr. Fisher next? Okay. Here is Mr. Fisher. He's the airline pilot who drank it down in Florida. Go ahead, Jim. Why did you attribute your nausea, vomiting, and hand tremors and confusion to real water? It was the only different thing added to my uh, daily diet. From uh, and I had a very consistent, you know, meal every day, or meals every day, and it was the only different thing that I had that whole week. Okay, look at look at the date on this, September fifteenth, two thousand seventeen. That's when Mr. Fisher Fisher sent in this complaint. What happened? I don't even know if he got the free water, but there was no investigation. That's the important thing. And then we get to the one I, I was trying to jump to, Mrs. Dorn. She filed two different complaints. One for her, that's the December one. And then her grandparents come out, and she files a second, second one. And so she's talking about the first one here, and then she talks about the second one. So this is Mrs. Dorn. It was, um, let's see, November, December 2016. And um, I let Real Water know about it at that time. And, um, and there was, I think, some low level uh, discomfort early in the year. And then uh, in March of 2017, uh, when my family was visiting, I wanted to share this special uh, product with them. <laughs> And I had, uh, uh, I got sick, and my parents got sick, and my cats got sick. Both of her parents in their 80s, if you remember, she said one of them was on chemo. She feeds them this, she's got a burning sensation in her stomach. She tells real water about all this. So what do they do? They send her some green water. So we have one, two, three people that we brought. All of these complaints are evidence. We introduced all of them in, the, in, the, in one package. So you've got all of them. Okay, so you would think, geez, you know, maybe there's a problem here. Maybe there's a problem here. But now they are confronted squarely with the problem. Mr. Watkins brought him on the stand. This is what Mr. Watkins told you. This is the email, first of all that his wife wrote, Janie Castile, you've heard her testimony, or you've heard her name a little bit, she's the production manager. She sends them an email, June 20th, 2018. My husband has been in the hospital for two weeks, two weeks, and the doctor wants him to stop drinking alkaline water. Notifies them in writing that her husband is in the hospital here in Las Vegas for two weeks, and the doctor says it's because of the water. Mr. Watkins, I brought him to trial. This is what he told you. Have any problems with you in a while? I did. I, uh, in 2000, May, June 2018, um, I became dizzy, uh, went into a coma, right? I lost my vision. Um, my speech, my wife, and uh, my granddaughter had to, um, uh, was trying to feed me water in bed and took me to the hospital. And that's where uh, they determined I had liver failure. In the hospital with acute liver failure. Written complaint to real water. No investigation whatsoever. And then look at the date this happened. This is an interesting thing. 5-26-2018. Who else went to the hospital at that exact same time with acute liver failure? Mr. Belsky. Exact same time. Okay, so they, they, they didn't know about Belsky until later, but they definitely knew about Mr. Watkins. So he's the first hospitalization. Next one is Mr. <coughs> Pham's neighbors. He had two different neighbors. He watched them with his own eyes being taken by an ambulance from their homes to hospitals here in Southern Nevada on successive days. With his own eyes, he saw it. Here's his testimony. 
So back to the points. We heard customers complain about the, the retail bottles. We heard of customer complaints about the retail bottles. No, I didn't hear about it until I left the company, and and my neighbor also um, he was when I went to the hospital because uh, they bought some some from Whole Food, and that's when I, I heard about it. I, I at that time. I just got let go of in uh, within the company, and they were in the hospital for a few days. So you heard, you heard that your neighbor had been hospitalized for. Well, I didn't hear about it. I I saw the ambulance came and 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 um, he and his, his wife went first, and then the following day he was the one who had to go to the hospital. And then was also. So your neighbor was taken to your neighbor and his wife were taken to the hospital. Correct. Okay, that those are the two right here on the convey. That was the man's name. Customer, that's what you convey, and spouse were sick. Okay. Taken to the hospital. So we have three different people taken to the hospital early on, 2018, 2019. And this, what a coincidence, this was about the time that Mr. Haley got acute liver failure from drinking real water. What a coincidence. So we have all these problems, and there's more, okay? There's more. And I know some of you have a little bit of a military background, and I ask you, you have you ever heard, seen a, a drill sergeant cry? Have you ever seen a drill sergeant cry in front of you? Ever happened before? These are tough people, okay? This is Mr. Desitel. Too many people were needlessly injured. This is what Mr. Desitel Right. Anyways, during that time, my daughter why does this come? Um, she fell because she's not in the ball letter from and uh, she had to get it taken out. It's it's a lot for me, because that's what you know, it's my daughter. And and I'm thinking, you know. Is it from this water? Is it from it? I don't know. I, I, but it, we, were all, we were all healthy beforehand, no problems, nothing. And all of a sudden she has a gold blair and then she has to get it put re You know, and, and it was great, Doctor Ed. She he said he had to take it out quick. So I, I I just I'm like, why? You wanna know why? Do you wanna know why? Mrs. Converse told us why. They didn't investigate complaints. Can I have Mrs. Converse's statement? Okay, so when you were, when you received uh, written complaints about your water causing some of the illness such as diarrhea, the solution was to send them free water. Correct. Okay, the solution was not to investigate as to what the potential problem was the water. Correct. Okay. Okay. In retrospect, do you think that was a good quality control procedure? No, sir. Serious injuries like this should have resulted in the production line being immediately stopped and a full investigation launched. That's what should have happened. And this isn't me arguing, okay? I told you I wasn't going to argue. This is what uh, the testimony was. Mike Bush, this is Mike Bush. He was the production manager in, I think, 2018 and 19. Remember, he was the one that had all the experience working for Nestle. This is what he said. Next, Shane. Okay. Did you become aware at any time that a real water customer was in the hospital? Uh, no, I don't. I don't know about that. I mean, that sounds like a big, big thing. I'm, I'm, say, for example, I'm just saying, I'm, we're in Nestle and something happens like this, so all management will shut the van down just about 15 minutes or so and get a safety review. Of it. Right, but yeah, right, yeah. I've got a crash and report the military center. But no, I don't remember that. No. If, if Nestle got a report that one of their customers drank their water and was in the hospital for two weeks, they would shut the assembly line down, correct? Right, yeah. Shut the assembly line down. That's what Nestle would do. He worked there. Okay. He worked there. Let's go back to Mr. Desitel. I asked him what he would have done if he'd known about these complaints. Okay? 
no dispute that it was caused by the hydrogen in the rear block. They didn't, they didn't bring any doctor to testify to the contrary. Their doctor said, yes, it, this is the cause. So there's really no dispute in this case about that. Now, let's turn to Hannah in Milwaukee. Because real water had two accomplices here. Okay? They didn't do it all themselves. Hannah in Milwaukee. Hannah has been determined to be liable for compensatory damages. It's still an issue on punitive. Milwaukee has admitted either one. Okay, as bad as real water was, I would suggest to you that Hannah in Milwaukee may be more culpable. And why is that? Okay, one, real water was a startup company, brand new company, okay? They did a lot of things wrong, but they were a brand new company. Hannah in Milwaukee had been around for decades. Hanna is one of the largest testing equipment manufacturers in the world. This is their catalog. It's going to be in evidence, Exhibit 375. I mean, just, just flip through this when you're back in the jury room and see the kind of things they make, okay? A lot of different things, and some of them are ore meters. This is one of the largest testing equipment companies in the world. They knew that. So, and then Real Water has admitted, they've admitted to compensatory liability. Got to give them some credit for that. Milwaukee, Milwaukee is still fighting it. Milwaukee, after all you've heard, is saying, oh, 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 oh not our problem, <coughs> not our problem. It's, it's all someone else's problem. You know, so, so let's go through the evidence on the compensatory liability for Milwaukee. And I think what I'm really going to key into is the fact that the general manager, or maybe he was vice president, you know, I get all these titles mixed up, Jason Brown, the key employee of Milwaukee, he was the managing speaking agent. He testified point blank, quote, it was my mistake, unquote. And I'm going to show you that a couple times. So their employee, their key employee says, quote, it was my mistake, unquote. And Milwaukee stands up here and says, no, it wasn't our mistake. You know, so, so at least the employee admits it. And this, this clip coming up, well, first of all, let's go back to the verdict form real quick. Shane, I just want to emphasize there's two reasons we contend Milwaukee's liable. Failure to provide an adequate warning, breaching the implied warranty, okay? When you sell a product, you make an implied warranty that that product is fit for a particular purpose. In this case, the court's already determined in the jury instructions that one of the purposes was to make negative or when people make out, measure negative or when you measure, make alcohol and water. So, so we contend that Milwaukee is liable for both reasons. But let's start off with the first, the failure to warn. Okay. The failure to warn next one slang, Shane, a little bit about ore meters first. All ore meters are not created equal. Okay? They're not all the same. All right? Some ore meters, you don't have to precondition the probe. Remember, we've, we've got this big dispute whether you should precondition it for five days in vinegar or 48 hours or whatever. Some more meters, you don't even have to do that. They just work for both positive and negative out of the box. Next one, Shane. So the lower priced ones, you remember Mr. Savaggio came here and he said, oh, oh, the ones that Hannah makes, those are, what do you call them, Lexuses. Those are the Lexus. And the Milwaukee ones, they're a Toyota. Okay, well, I would dispute that because, you know, when you buy a Toyota on a car lot, you drive it off the lot, the Toyota can go forward, you throw it in reverse, the Toyota can go backwards. But this Milwaukee ore meter, it only measures positive when you take it out of the box. To measure negative, you have to do something to it. So maybe Mr. Savaggio think it, thinks it's a Toyota, but we think it's unfit. But in any event, the lower price ones, the ones like the Milwaukee one, 
You have to precondition to get a negative warp measurement. You have to stick it in vinegar, because there's no conditioning solution anymore. You have to stick it in vinegar, okay? Now, what should, this is what we contend that Milwaukee should have done. That they should have put instructions in the user manual, in the user manual about number one, why should you be doing this? Because it will be inconsistent readings. Two, how should you do it? You have to dip it in vinegar. And three, how long should you put it in vinegar? How long should you soak it? That's what they should have put in the user manual. That's what our contention is. Other ORP meters do this. Other ORP meters that make the lower priced ones, this is what is in their instruction manual. Okay? Milwaukee didn't do it, but other people did it. Next one, Shane. And so they sold this meter that required preconditioning, and they didn't tell the customers about anything. That you needed to precondition it, the consequences of not preconditioning it, or how to precondition it. Um, so let's start with the first point. Some ORP meters don't require preconditioning. See that big the, the catalog I had my hand a minute ago? <laughs> Look at this. This is a hand-up ORP meter, all right? This is one of the, I guess this is the Lexus, maybe it's a Ferrari, I don't know. Whatever, it's definitely better than the MW500, which bears a striking resemblance to my garage door opener. Um, but in any event, this one, you don't have to dip the probe tip into vinegar or anything else. It works right away. They precondition it. So how do we know that some of them don't require preconditioning? Well. Dr. Fornbaugh was their expert. He told you this. He told you that some of them work for negative and positive right of the box. Only, only the Milwaukee and some of the other low end ones have the condition. Shane? So uh, the hand one and the uh, American Monitor one that we have here as exhibit eight and nine will read negative off reads out of the box without oxidizing. Is that correct? As I understood it, yes, that they would that they were both uh work Your Honor, objection. You know, essentially right away, just putting it in whatever solution you wanted to test. Right. Uh, that's what your objection is. Oh, that is my objection. Your Honor, this was played in the courtroom. Yes, it was played in the courtroom as impeachment. My apologies. Okay, thank you. Just, just to explain, ladies and gentlemen, <coughs> I asked Dr. Fortenbaugh this question. He pretended he didn't remember this anymore, so I played this for I played this to, to remind him of what he had said. So, he said, uh, go ahead. Essentially, right away, just putting it in whatever solution you wanted to test. I think uh, American Marine One had a range of minus 2,000 plus 2,000. Uh, that's another manufacturer, American Marine. So, we have the Hanna one, the American Marine one. There's others, but they work right out of the box. Okay. Don't have to go through this rigmarole. Rig rig um, so, we contend that if your orb meter works differently than everyone else's, the, the Lexus's, you should tell people this, okay? Tell, tell them that the Toyota won't go in reverse unless you do something to it first. That's, that's the failure to warn case in a nutshell. Um, so, we have jury instructions on the uh, failure to warn. This is in your kit. Uh, you know, I wish I could remember which one it was. But they have an obligation to provide their products with warnings. This isn't optional. This isn't someone in Milwaukee saying, oh, should we provide warnings today? Oh, I don't feel like it. No, they have to provide warnings that communicate dangers that result of the, from a foreseeable use of their product. We know it's a foreseeable use because the judge already gave you a finding that they knew the product was being used to make alkaline water. They might not have known real water was using it for that purpose, but they knew people, 30% of their customers were using it to make alkaline water. So they had an obligation to provide warnings. We have more information. So anticipate the danger. Okay, the danger in this case is it doesn't get conditioned and there's inconsistent warnings. So they should give a warning of that danger. If they don't, the product's defective. All right? The product is defective. 
you know, some of you say, well, the upper breathing meter works fine. Under the law, if it doesn't have a warning and it's unreasonably dangerous, it's defective. Last one, Jim. So this is the test, okay? Because sometimes, you know, some of these other manufacturers do give warnings, and the issue when we come to trial is, well, is the warning good enough, okay? In this case, we don't really have that issue because there's no warning whatsoever in the user manual, but if you do give a warning, it has to be designed so it reasonably attention, catches the attention of the consumer, it has to be comprehensible, you have to give a fair indication, you know, you have to tell people what the specific risks are. In this case, it's the fact that it's going to be inconsistent if you don't do the conditioning, and that it doesn't work if you don't condition it. That's what they should have told people. And it has to be of intensity. You know, you have to, you can't just put it in super small print somewhere, okay? You've got to actually tell people about it. And that's what the other manufacturers do. So that is what is required. And I told you on the slide that other ORP manufacturers, or low-end ORP manufacturers, give this type of warning. That's not just me. Dr. Fortinbaugh admitted this. And again, this was also used for impeachment. So again, Shane, go ahead. Okay, so let's leave and I'll walk you out of it for now. So other ORP manufacturers provide information to their user manuals with regards to how to oxidize probes, correct? Some of them do, some of them don't. Some of them do, some of them don't. So Milwaukee didn't, but the others, others did. And that's what they should have done in this case. They should have given the warning. Now, let's take a look a little more quickly at fair warning liability. And Let me have my slide on Mr. Bush. There's two key witnesses in the failure to warn case. There's Mr. Bush, and I played you a little clip from him already. He's the former veteran. He sent Milwaukee an email. Says, how do we calibrate the meter because the written instructions are unclear? Okay, you know, calibrate, oxidize. People are using that term interchangeably. So they told him to use the conditioning kit, even though it had been removed from the market two years, two years earlier. And so this is where I told you, Jason Brown, this is the Milwaukee employee. He says he made a mistake. And I'm going to play that testimony for you. So the Milwaukee employee says he made a mistake. Mr. Robbins over there says everything Milwaukee has done is peachy keen. All right. And Mr. Bush, he testifies that if he had been told the proper way to do it by Milwaukee, he would have done it. Again, he's military. Now, this clip from Mr. Bush is four minutes long. Okay? But this, this is the quintessential proof for the failure to warn case. So, so play a chain. I don't have that clip queued up. Which page line was that? Oh, okay. You don't have that queued up? Oh, let me go back. So Mr. Bush testified, first of all, that he thought you should, you should uh, oxidize it for five minutes. Why did he think that? Because Mr. Jones told him that, trained him that, five minutes. This is the clip from Mr. Jones that shows that he thought you should do it for five minutes. Um, and this is Mr. Mr. Bush's testimony that that's why he thought it was five minutes. Go ahead, Jay. Okay, this is a YouTube video that Mr. Jones prepared, which says that you can calibrate the oil meter by soaking for five minutes of vinegar. You see that? Yeah, my other friend doing that with me. And it was, it was part of the process. I remember that for sure. And it, you soaked it for five minutes when you originally started using the oil meter. Right. Five minutes of the skill. Right. Right, so that, that was the, that's what Mr. Jones taught you to do, so it for five minutes. Yeah, there was some uh, talking to Vader, and for sure there was uh, 10 minutes of Vader, and then we got it. So they soaked it for five minutes. Not five days, five minutes. This is Mr. Bush, again, he's the production manager. He was the one overall responsible for production. 
He says five minutes, not five days. So I just wanted to show you that to, to put in context what I'm going to show you next. All right? And again, this is the four-minute video. This is where Mr. Bush sends the email to Milwaukee, says, hey, we need help. We need help on how to work these things. Milwaukee sends uh, the email back, and then Mr. Brown says, it was my mistake. I gave him the wrong instructions. And then I confront Mr. Bush with that. This is the first time he has been told that Milwaukee made a mistake. And so I confirm that. Is this the first you know that Milwaukee made a mistake? And I say, well, if they had told you the right instructions, would you have followed them? Remember, we have to prove that they would have acted upon a, a proper warning. This is the acted upon. He's telling you that he would have acted upon it. He would have changed the procedure from five minutes to five days if Mr. Brown hadn't made a mistake. Shane, go ahead. Get it for me. So you remember asking, quote, do the millimeters need to be calibrated, question mark, unquote. Correct? Yep. I didn't know that. And you asked that question because at that time, February 22nd, 2019, you didn't know one way or the other whether the new readers needed to be calibrated. Correct. Right, correct. Right. This is kind of my third direction, obviously, to get calibrated. It's like a hazy, hazy from where I want to get concrete. And you already said the reason you wanted the instructions on how to calibrate them is you were getting inconsistent readings from the old meter. Right, inconsistent readings and just, um, yeah. <laughs> okay, and do you remember the Milwaukee person sending you some uh, responding to this email? I'm not sure they did, I'm not sure they did. Okay, he says, quote, here's a link from our website. I think this information is helpful. Do you see that? I do. Okay. Has anyone indicated to you that? Milwaukee made a mistake in the instructions I gave you as to how to calibrate the world meter. Uh, absolutely not. I would have tried that one. No. Okay, so directing your attention to Exhibit 65, please, which is the testimony from Jason Brown, the man who sent you that email. So this is his deposition testimony, Paul. Okay. okay, so I mean, why don't we start on four? So he, he says he sent you the link that I've already shown you, right? Do you see that? That's it. And then he says what he should have done is he should have told you to put it in vinegar for four or five days. That's what he says he should have done. You see that? Four or five days, not four or five minutes. Okay. Right. That's what he should. That's what he says he should have told you. I don't want, I don't want to mischaracterize anything, so let me read you the testimony, sir. On page 142, lines 9 through 12, this is George question, what you should have done, if you had known he didn't have a cleaning kit, is tell him to put it in vinegar for four to five days, right? Answer, yes. Unquote. Did I read that correctly? Did I read that correctly, Mr. Bush? Oh, yeah. I'm reading. I'm reading a little bit of it. And you thought from your training with Mr. Jones that you were supposed to put in vinegar for four to five minutes, not four to five days, correct? Right, that's correct. And following it on, we go, question, and that was your mistake, referring to the Milwaukee person's mistake, and he says, answer, that was my mistake, yes, sir, unquote. Did I read that right? You read it right? I read it. Okay, prior, okay, prior to today, did you know that Milwaukee made a mistake in responding to your email as to how to calibrate the meter? Anyway, was the answer no, sir? No, no, I did not know there was a mistake to that. So you're pretty I never recognize. Okay. And following up, question. So you would agree with me that when the real water asked for information on how to calibrate, that you did not give them the correct information. Answer it. I did not give them the correct information because I thought they were the one that had the kit. That is right. Did I read that correctly? You read it correctly. So this is the first you've known today that Milwaukee did not give you the correct information on how to calibrate the meter. Is that right? And so 
I am correct. This is the first you've known that they did not give you the correct information to calibrate. That's correct. There was a big deal that was um, kits out to customer and everything. At the time, we didn't fill the whole thing up. It would still have been the process quite a bit. If it had to be done, it would have been done for sure. Right. If, if they had told you to put it in the room for the five days, you would have done that, correct? Right. Yes, yes, I would have. But you didn't do that because your understanding was four to five minutes, right? Right. That's right. And, and again, he said he would have done it. This, this military, 20 years in the military. Four to five days, he would have done it. If they told him four or five years, he would have done it. Like I said, he's military, all right? But when you get the verdict form, that series of, of uh, uh, questions for each one is to, under the warning, would they have acted on the warning? This is the testimony that that uh, requires that be answered yes. He would have acted upon it. And finally, ladies and gentlemen, I think I got six minutes. I want to play you the testimony that we just referenced from Jason Brown. This is Jason Brown, and this is where the Milwaukee employee admits, I made a mistake. He admits, I did not send them the right instructions. So he's taking some accountability here, okay? You got to give him credit. I wish Mr. Robbins would take some accountability, but the employee at least is taking accountability, and this is what he says. And what you should have done if you had known you didn't have a cleaning kit is tell him to put it in uh later for four to five days, right? Yes. And that was your mistake? That was my mistake. Yes, sir. Oh, Shane. So you were that, was, that was my mistake. That was my mistake. This is the key employee of Milwaukee admitting that he made the mistake in his interaction with uh, Mr. Bush. Next shape. Yeah, with me that when you know, water asked for information on how to calibrate that you did not give them the correct information? I uh, did not give them the correct information because I uh, thought they were the one that had to get that girl. You said it was your mistake, right? Right. Given that the 925 instructions was incorrect. This is the key. Twice he said it was his mistake. Once he said they didn't give him the proper instructions. This is this is an admission. This is a confession by the Milwaukee employee that dealt directly with Mr. Bush. And Shane, can we highlight that, that? highlight that for the jury? That was my mistake. I did not give them the correct information. That was my mistake. I did not give them the correct information. That was my mistake. I did not give them the correct information. That was my mistake. I did not give them the correct information. That was my mistake. I did not give them the correct information. That was my mistake. I did not give them the correct information. That was my mistake. I did not give them the correct information. I think we're going to leave it at that today, ladies and gentlemen. We'll come back tomorrow. And then we'll pick up the rest, but I'll probably have another 45 minutes. Mr. Parker. I didn't want to know. Okay? I don't want to forget Mr. Parker. So I won't. Um, we'll see you tomorrow. Have a good night. Thank you very much for your time. All right, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, they tell me tomorrow at 10 30. I'll see you. And uh, remember, you're modest not to converse amongst yourselves or with anyone else on any subject in the trial. We need to watch and listen to this report of our commentary on the trial. We need to in this case by any meeting or information, including the public invitations, newspaper, television, radio, social media, Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, Instagram, some of our Snapchat. And last but not least, do not form or express any opinion on. Any subject connected with this trial and the cause is finally submitted to you during deliberation. All rise for the board to agree. All right, Council. <coughs> Ten for Good morning, everyone. Let's go ahead and set up our appearances for the record. Good morning, everyone.
Joel, do you remember the problem about the water in from the left side? So I can the water over there. So. We're going to just go around with some new white flag out there. Good morning, Your Honor. Rob Robbins from Milwaukee Instruments. All right. Before we get started or continue, uh, do you have anything else at the present? Yes, Your Honor. Okay. Um, Robbins. And it could be that I don't have the correct verdict form, but the one that I do have, um, I just wanted to raise. Uh, the, the first item, it says, real water has admitted liability and causation. And then in the, the next sentence of still number one, it says, the court has determined that Hannah is liable for damage, for plaintiff's compensatory damages. I think that's misleading. So I think, you know, maybe that needs to be broken up. Both of them say the same thing there. Um, I would say real water has admitted liability and causation and is liable for plaintiff's compensatory damages. And then I would say the court has determined that Hannah is liable uh, for plaintiff's compensatory damages so that it doesn't look like only one and not the other. And then the, the other one was on number four. Um, is this, this is option number four, or is it still, are we still under verdict? Still under verdict form. I, item or line item, paragraph four, I guess, or decision four. Um, it says unfit and un on my cap it, on my copy is bold and underlined. Yeah. I take that out. I don't know why. Those are my two issues. So Mr. Peppermint made the changes. Uh, Discuss it with Mr. Robbins, and if there's no problem at that point, that'll be the work. Yes, sir. Thank you, Your Honor. Mr. Um, I, know you, I think you need to do that right away because I'm going to get you to that question, the verdict form, right away. So, just for point of clarification, Joel, for the water, there's going to be a, a new question, too. We're going to change the numbering. Is that what's happening? I was going to change the numbering. I, the numbering. I, I think the numbering's going to be the same. Yeah. Just okay. worry. Yeah. Yeah, I think that would be confusing. All right, just a one A or one B type thing. Right. Let's see what else we have. Uh, we received uh, last yesterday around four forty three motions filed by Hannah Instruments. Yes, sir. And I'm, I'm assuming that Hannah's going to argue those or just submit them on the briefs. What are the motions? We have fifty Rule fifty motions. Three of them, you know, I brought a copy, my copy, you can, I didn't write on them, you can have them if you want. I mean, I don't have the copies of them. May I approach on? As panel member number seven, you got here yet? Sir? Yes, Your Honor. The whole jury is here. Should I say real water is admitted liability for plaintiff's compensatory damages? I just damages? think they should be the same. To the extent that they're going to be the same. You guys are working out. Get it done. Four plaintiff's compensatory damages. Eric, can you make sure? Tell him. Yeah. The court has determined that Hannah is liable for plaintiff's compensatory damages. Please go directly to the question. Yes. Okay. <coughs> All right. While we, while we wait for the email transmission, Let's go ahead and, and deal very quickly with um, uh, the motions. And I guess there's three that were filed yesterday. Yes, sir. At 440. Yes, sir. And it appears one is for um, motion for judgment number one as a matter of law in the jury trial, this one's rule 50 regarding plaintiff's request for punitive damages against any instruments. Yep. The second would be number two as a matter of law regarding NRCP Rule 50 
regarding plaintiff six cause of action on inadequate instruction. And last but not least, uh, judgment number three as to a matter of law, pursuant to rule 50 regarding cause of action as an inherently dangerous product. We're dealing with plaintiff seven cause of action. Okay. So you have the floor. Thank you. Your Honor, the first question I just put to the court, if you want to deal with these now, we'd like to deal with these later, we'd like to get the jury in now. I'm happy to do it however the, the court wants to do this, uh, and how the court wants to, to to take a look at those and, uh, and, and let me know. If the court would like to review those motions, uh, and then we'll have a discussion on it at, right after lunch. I'm happy to wait until that time is done. Uh, I don't think you're going to get through the plaintiffs. Closing maybe is all, and mine will not have started uh, until after that. And so I'd have to wait until maybe after lunch if that's what the court would, would be inclined to do. Or, or and it's not whether or not what you want to do, it's more like what, where, how do you want to schedule that? Yeah, we'll, we will agree that there's no waiver if, if the court wants to wait. Okay. That makes things a lot easier. Right? So I tell you what, this is what we'll do. Number one, I think we want to bring the jury in. We can continue on. That's a high priority. Secondly, it's my understanding, we got to be done. And this is why we have to be done. Panel member number one, what's the story? Uh, Your Honor, uh, panel member number one relayed to me this morning that her mother passed last Monday. And she has to transport her mother's remains to New York this weekend. Okay. Well, that's why we have to get done with the argument today. And uh, as far as closing teachers. And, and of course, that's a priority right now. And so what we'll do is this. Um, let's go ahead and continue with closings. There's been no waiver for the record of defendant Hannah Instruments um, Rule 50 motions on the three different areas that were filed on October 2nd. 2023 at 4.30 p.m. So, and what we'll do is this, we'll decide uh, as we go through the day when will be a good time to argue about something. But we have, to, we have to finish closing. We need to have to close the room. Yeah, I get it, but there's been no waiver, so you don't have to worry about that. Thank you, Eric. Okay. We'll wait for those on a time. The yes. last thing that I do have is that I do have an expert that we talked about last night real quickly. Uh, That's Peter Damages. Yes, it is, but he cannot be here tomorrow. But it doesn't sound like anyone can be here on Thursday, Friday. A solution that Mr. Parker came up with as well is we can take uh, using SRCP with regard to the damages aspect. If we get there, they check the box. Uh, we can go with your litigation services, Mark. Right? Can we take that. Uh, some new line. Okay. Uh, in order for him to be his deposition to be taken via video and then played to the jury. Um, here. He did have his deposition taken in the normal course, but um, this would be more trial uh, for trial. So yeah, we agreed to do that after the round of uh, court combination too. Yeah. When will that be done? Be done at 30, so Okay, that's fine. Uh, I've not agreed to that, Your Honor, and I think it precludes jurors from asking questions of this witness. And I, I didn't. This is the first I've heard. Nobody's going to be here Thursday and Friday, no matter what. Uh, we, we've been dark. They were, they've always been on the schedule start. Since we started pre-trial motions. Oh, that's right. There were two days in there. Correct. So we would be back Monday no matter what time. Well, I'm hoping we're done today as, as far as well, tomorrow. And because here's the thing. For example, this is a really important issue. Right now, the juror number one has said, what? He's on the list the weekend, right? Yeah. That's right, juror. So, so we start the survey finish. Right. And Your Honor, if I could approach the clerk, I have redacted copies of the three exhibits. Make, make that Mr. Robbins look. Show <laughs> Mr. Robbins. Mm -hmm. I just to show the question. Show him. Sorry, I gave him a bus. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. 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 Bless you. 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 Bless you.
Is it three or is it three? 745, 745, 745. So I need to know. And here's what everybody has to understand. This isn't my only time. Right. I have a firm trial date starting Monday. And the only thing I was going to say is, you spoiled us, Your Honor. Your Honor, that's not, yeah. that's not Mr. Robin's Rob um, expert anyway. It's, no, no, I get it. Yeah, so I don't think the reaction is well. I have a trial starting Monday. No, no, this no, is no. my only case. Oh, I, I, thought we, we were, I thought we had all this time because we were on. Go this long and have to come back, and so that's why you scheduled that one in. I don't know. No, no. I mean, I, I can't from a procedural history. I can't tell you that's everything because I don't. I have 800, 900 cases, right? Yeah. But I can tell you this: what do we have? Trial set Monday. Right. What if we set that? Oh my. Oh, uh, so it was recent. That's what I was. Yeah. Matter of fact, quickly approach. Right. Uh, for the record, these are redacted versions of 745, 746, and 757. <laughs> <laughs> and Mr. Robbins, do those meet your views? I don't like them, but it's not, 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 I subject, no, I'm talking about. I understand you might have some standing objections, but I'm talking about as far as the changes yes. and corrections you recommend. Those weren't the changes I just looked at. That was something I Okay. Well, did you print another verdict form? Print one? Yeah. Well, that is it. Yes. We, oh, we yes. discussed this that through the interrogatory request for admissions that were already admitted. No, no, no. That's not what he's asking me. He was asking me about the special verdict form. The special said, verdict. That's form. not what I was looking at. I was looking at. Oh, okay. I just want to make sure we're fine on the special verdict form, so we can continue. Are we? Oh, Mr. Robbins, are we fine with the changes made to the special verdict form? Based on what we discussed, I haven't seen them, but yes. Oh no. It was hey. emailed to you. I got a copy of your correct email. Can you hand them to Mr. Robbins so you can take a look at it? You might not have access to it. I do not. You need to go over No, no, it's close enough. How are you feeling today? Good. I'm just going to do this. Yep. We made four copies. Where's our copies? We have our So I made four. I made four. That one didn't turn out right. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mr. 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 Thank Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Thank It's the same. Maybe the change. There are 30 million up for spikes. Just ask why we got away from the word. Is it too big to the jury? Why we got rid of the damages? We had that conversation. We had that conversation. I was in that conversation. He has one. The reason why we got rid of the compensatory is because every other question says it's just damages. It separates the pillars, but then it separates the pillars. All right, so I'll just. Explain to the jury this is one thing and that punitives is still not determined, then I'm fine. Okay. Can I get him back? Yes, they may have been changing. Yes. Just want to make sure. Got it? <coughs> okay, we're ready to go, right? Yes, sir. Good. Yes. Bring it. Okay. All rest of the jury. Please be seated. All right. Uh, did you already stipulate to the presence of the jury? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Good morning. And uh, we're going to continue with, with uh, closing arguments. It's my understanding that uh, Mr. Kemp is going to continue with this. Is that correct, sir? Yes, sir. Uh, good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, this is what we're trying to do today. I'm going to try to go about 45 minutes more. Uh, Mr. Parker's, what do you have, 15? Give her two now. And then uh, Mr. Adu will go, and then uh, uh, Mr. Rasmussen, and then uh, Milwaukee's Council. Okay, we'll try to get all done. 
All right, let's pick up where we left off, Shane. This is Mr. Bush, I'm just showing to you to remember where we left off. He was the uh, production manager. He was the one that contacted Milwaukee, asked for some help on, on, uh, on uh, the meter. Uh, next one, Shane. Next one. Okay, this is Mr. Brown's testimony. I played to put down that little loop again. So he said it was his mistake and uh, that he didn't give the correct information. So now we're caught up. That's where we were. Okay. So this leads us to the problem that Real Water had. So I'm going to show you the testimony of three different, <coughs> maybe two different employees that, that uh, corroborate the fact that the meters weren't working correctly. Okay, the first one's Patty Converse, and she was the person who was the receptionist, became the quality control director, a uh, position she held for 27 months. So this is what she says about how the board meter was working in terms of, of, of uh, Dysfunction. Go ahead. In other words, the warp meters came and they weren't, uh, they didn't measure consistently? You mean? Correct, yeah. Okay, so you always had order new ones? Yes. So, if as you've said, the orc meters weren't calibrated or working properly, it would be difficult to get. Exact. Exact. Correct. Warp readings, right? Correct. So the water could be inconsistent from one day to another. Yes. I mean, it was inconsistent from one day to the other. It had to be, right? Correct. Inconsistent, some days they had to add more uh, of a concentrate, which had the, the hydrazine in it, the rocket fuel. Some days they didn't. So, Mr. Parker is going to show the chart again uh, where the uh, uh, public health authorities found that you, know, you had waves of uh, outbreak cases. Um, the next person we're going to show is another real water employee. This is Mr. Lyndon Ghana. He was the lead technician for retail bottles. So he's also going to testify that the meter gave inconsistent readings. And I think he's going to say, happened to him 20 or 30 times. Go ahead, Jim. So basically, you think you would put two and a half gallons of concentrate in, and if the reading was low, you would add another gallon and a quarter concentrate. Is that right? Is that right? Yes. This was done, was this done on each and every batch that you made? Uh, yes. He says every time he had more concentrate. I don't think it was really every time, but that's what he said. Uh, next one, please. Did, were there times that sometimes the meter gave you inconsistent or strange readings? Yes, sometimes, like different numbers? Right. Yeah, but sometimes so I would I would get the guys in the office now and they will give me another another meter. Yeah. Okay, so sometimes the meter gave you strange numbers and you went and got another meter. Yeah, because the other one might be broke or need to be calibrated or something. So he goes uh, stop saying so he goes and gets another meter to use right away. Obviously he couldn't be conditioned for five days. He's going to go pick up a new meter and start using it. So uh, this is the final segment where he says that they had 18 to 20 instances of inconsistent readings. Just he, just he observed this. Okay, this is not including all the other techs, the production manager, et cetera. Go ahead. So in the three years, you had at least 18 to 20 instances where you had inconsistent or funny results from the meter. Correct. <laughs> Okay, the third employee we're going to talk about is Mr. Akins. He was the one that made what we refer to as the super bad batch in the fall of 2020. And he's going to testify that he used the meter. He got 130. Remember, they were trying to get to 225 to 300. So he got 130. So he dumped in more concentrate. Point blank, he's going to testify this. Go ahead. So you measured it, and for some reason, you measured 130 that day. So it, was, it was lower than it should have been, right? And when you measured it, you used the orb meter that we, we have here as Exhibit 1. Yes. So you added another two and a half gallon. Yeah, I figured that would be the least amount to make it change to what I needed it to change to. So that, uh, when you get the verdict form, you'll see that there's a, a number of questions on was it the cause for each specific plaintiff? That's the testimony that supports the yes to on those points. 
Okay, so the, the problem here, again, we talked about a lot. There's, there's no warnings in this user manual. So here's the key issues on the warnings plan. Okay. So did, it tell, did this manual tell customers that the probe tip needed to be conditioned to take negative oil readings? We know the answer is no. Two, did it tell them it would take hours to days to take negative readings if you didn't prepare it for, uh, properly? The answer is no. There's nothing. You'll have this. You'll have this user manual back there. Uh, next question. Did the user manual tell them how to condition the probe to take negative oil readings? readings? And again, it's to put in vinegar for five days, not five hours, five minutes. Uh, so nothing is in this user manual. Um, so just to reinforce this point, you had to, according to the Milwaukee General Manager, you had to put the probe in for five days. This is his testimony one more time. Do you, 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 you advise customers to soak it in vinegar for four to five days? We went through all those, right? Yes, sir. And remember, Mr. Bush testified that he was doing it for five minutes because that's what Blaine Jones taught him. But if they had told him four to five days, he wouldn't have done it. Um, and customers were confused. We know they were confused because the, Mr. Brown testified they were confused. And Mr. Fortenbaugh, who was the defendant's warning expert, he conceded that they had confused customers. Can we have Fortenbaugh real quick? Well, literally dozens of customers wrote emails asking about the oxidization, how to do it. Did they not? Dozens. Yeah, I saw uh, people writing on customer service line or Yeah, so when you don't put the information on how to use the meter in the manual, people are going to be confused. It wasn't just that real water was stupid. Uh, it was dozens. Everybody. People that were using this for negative water weren't told how to use it for negative water. Um, and as I indicated yesterday briefly, other ORP manufacturers, and ORP, I hope I never hear that word after this case, but other ORP manufacturers did put it in their manuals. So if they had meters that had this same uh, problem that you had to oxidize it, they told people about it. And this is the admission of their experts saying that. Good. Well, other old manufacturers provide information in their user manuals with regards to how to oxidize probes, correct? Well, some of them do, some of them don't. And the problem, one more time, is if you don't oxidize it right, it takes hours to days. Hours to days to take the readings. And they admitted this. Go ahead, please read. This is Jason Brown. In other words, a canyon water customer can take it out of the box and start measuring negative orb of canyon water, correct? They can, but to get a negative reading, uh, it it's a slow process without oxidizing the probe. So in other words, it will read negative RP, but it's gonna take a long time to get that negative reading they're looking for without oxidizing the probe. Well, you say it's going to take a long time before. I don't know. I don't have a specific time out of the box of how long it will take to read negative or to the degree of measuring canyon water. But it will read negative or out of the box. It just takes a lot longer to get that read. How much longer? I don't know. Hours, days, months? What are we talking about? Hours to days is what, what I would say. And of course, the problem is they're using this in a plant to make water. So you, you can't just hold this thing and measure for days. You can't do it. You, just can't, you can't use an issue that way. So that, that's the primary problem. Um, going to the user manual. This is, there's the user manual on the slide. I've held it up before. This is pretty skimpy, OK? And, uh, pretty skimpy. Um, you're going to have this in evidence. You can read it. It doesn't say anything about the key points of the case. Uh, it's his book, Slang Connect. It's Shane Connect. My name's Shane your name now. So, what you're saying is that it will take. You say. Without oxidizing. To, go ahead. Without oxidizing the probe, it could take hours to days to get the proper negative reading of tangible water. Uh, next one, Slang Shane. 
So if you did it for five minutes, would I be correct that it would take hours or days to read negative? Possibly. So the problem is they were accessing it for five minutes and not feeding it five days. Let's give you consistent results. I appreciate it. Okay, this is the manual, uh, user manual that I can hold up my hand. And the problem is it really doesn't say anything. Okay, next one. As big as a cocktail napkin. Put a cap. It's four and a half by five. I think cocktail napkins are five and a half by five. Big as a keynote ticket. There's no information on here. That is the fundamental problem in the case. And that's what you'd be asked to decide whether or not this provided adequate warnings. And we say it did not. Remember Dr. Motley, he was our warning expert. He told you there was nothing in here. Their warnings expert, Dr. Fortenbaugh, he conceded. This is Dr. Fortenbaugh. He conceded the two key points. Is there anything in the user manual about oxidization? Is there anything that, that tells you about the inconsistent results? Go ahead, Chief. Okay, so the user manual doesn't say anything about how to oxidize correct? In the user manual, okay. in the user manual, it doesn't tell you that if you don't oxidize, the probe could potentially give you inconsistent ratings, right? It does not say that. Uh, that's a failure to warn. Just that simple. Um, let's skip over the implied warnings. The sec this is the failure to warn case. The second uh, theory is implied breach of implied warranty of fitness for particular purpose. An implied warranty is a promise. It's a promise made by the manufacturer that a product will work for the purpose it's being purchased for. And that's what the particular purpose is. Why are they purchasing this product? They're purchasing it to make an alkaline water. Okay. So the issue here is, was this water fit? Was it, I mean, excuse me, was the meter fit to make alkaline water? So Shane, can we have the jury question for you? Uh, do we form my uh, question? I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. That's the verdict form. Two is going to be failure to warn. Again, the question should be yes for the reasons I've just indicated. Those are all yes because of the problem. Uh, the implied warranty one, this is the one we're focused on now. So the issue is was it fit or unfit for this purpose? Was it Working properly, but it did not work properly when you measured negative ore. Our contention is that it didn't work properly because you had to condition it in the uh, uh, vinegar for five days first. And that was something that was not the case for the other ore readers. Again, here's Dr. Fordenbaugh's testimony. This is their expert. He's going to admit that other manufacturers who make other ore readers, you don't have to go through this rigmarole with the probe. It worked right out of the box. Okay, can I have Dr. Ford Ball? I think we're on the top of 32. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah, we stopped over that shape. Mr. Mr. Parker, 20 minutes. <laughs> For the hand one and the, the American Monitor one that we have here as Exhibit 8 and 9, we read negative ore readings out of the box without oxidizing. Is that correct? As I understood it, yes, that they were, that they were both uh, work, you know, essentially right away, just putting it in whatever solution they wanted to test. I think the uh, American Marine one had a range of Minus 2,000 plus 2,000. So we have two other meters he's talking about. One made by Hanna, which is in the catalog. Two by another manufacturer called American Marine. You take them out of the box, you can measure negative ore. Okay? You don't have to go through this five days of building stuff for these. And that's why we don't think this was a fit product. That's why we've submitted that. Uh, with regards to the purpose, uh, the judge, Shane, can I have this? The judge gave you a finding. The court, the judge, has found that one of the particular purposes of the fork meter was to take negative ore readings while making alkaline water. So you don't have to go in the back and say, oh, well, you know, was this a purpose or was that a purpose? This is what the court has found. This is binding on you. Uh, that's what the next sentence says. It's a binding determination. So the only issue is, for this particular purpose, what real water was using it for was it a 
fit or an unfit product to take negative readings? And we contend no. All right, let's go to the uh, punitive uh, question. On the verdict form, you're going to see uh, at the end there's a series of questions. There's three questions. Okay, very interesting. Okay. So, remember, real water admitted that they're liable for compensatory damages, uh, so you don't have to determine that for them. Hannah is liable for compensatory damages. You don't have to determine that for him. Then you have the two questions on Milwaukee, and then we go to the end of the verdict form, which is yes, no's on the punitive damages. So I'm going to focus now on Hannah and Milwaukee, why they should be determined to be yes or no. Shane, can I have my next chart? I know, quick. I know, I know you guys know most of this already. Right. Um, they knew the probe tip had to be conditioned to take negative or breeze. They didn't tell people about it. The user manual didn't inform them of that. They had another product that would work properly, the conditioning kit. And remember, they removed that from the market in June 2017. They didn't replace it. They didn't replace it. So here they have the problem, the solution to the problem, the, the conditioning kit. They have to remove it from the market, and they don't. They don't give people a, a solution. They don't. They don't either develop a new conditioning kit, refer to another person's conditioning kit. Or most of all, they don't put anything in the user manual uh, that that uh, tells people how to condition the probe. Next one, Jay. So they did not add the warning to the user manual. How simple would that have been? Okay, make it make it uh, five pages long, not six. Uh, uh, then we had the 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 exchange with Mr. Bush. Okay. Uh, Mr. Bush reached out to them, and then they sent back, and they said, it's my mistake. You know, I gave them the wrong instruction. Next one, Shane. Uh, at one point, they even told Real Water to use the conditioning kit when it was off the market for 18 months. Uh, they knew customers were confused. I, I played the expert uh, testimony about that. They knew. They knew they were And how could there not be confusion? Okay, you don't put it in the instructions. How could there not be confusion? So they knew there was a confusion, and yet all they did was they just kept sending out this inadequate user manual. Uh, we don't think that supports the finding of the punitive damages for both uh, Milwaukee and Hannah. All right, shift gears real fast. I'm going to shift over to the compensatory damages. Um, uh, no dispute that we have proven that the plaintiffs in this case suffered permanent injury. Uh, Kathy Robertson's, she died. I mean, much more permanent than that. Uh, we start off the case with an explanation of acute liver failure. Just go through this real quick. Critical medical condition, complete loss of liver function. You got to go to the hospital, usually near the ICU. Uh, the liver doesn't work. It's not working at all. Uh, and the consequences, next one, Jim. The consequences are pretty severe. Fatigue, jaundice, bleeding, loss of consciousness, pressure in the brain, which is leads to this encephalopathy. Okay, 20% of the patients die. Uh, Kathy Ryerson died. This is a serious, serious disease, and there has not been any dispute about that. So they did a biopsy on uh, James Yu. James is sitting back there. And the biopsy finding was significant. Can, can we have uh, the testimony, please? This is Dr. Hudson telling you what they found from the biopsy. He knew she had scars as well. That is correct. He did. So, out of the five liver biopsies we have, four of them on the window and one of Mr. Yu, three of them show permanent liver scar. And don't forget, Mrs. Ryerson had a liver biopsy before she got it. Okay. Okay. If you get a scar on the outside of your body, you know, you can see it visually, right? If it's on the inside of your body, in the liver, you can't see that visually. Okay, so in Mr. Yu's case, they stuck a needle down into his liver, they pulled something out, and they found scarring. Okay, no dispute that Mr. Yu has scarring. Uh, the other plaintiffs, we had the testimony from Dr. Hudson. Again, he, uh, I was going to play this for you, but it was really too much doctor speak even for me. Okay, so I just cut it down to the essence. These are the two slides from the uh, other people that drank real water that went to Loma Linda. See the blue, the blue in there? That is the permanent scarring. That is the permanent scarring. 
How do we know that? Dr. Hudson told us that. Do we have that yet? But you see all this blue? And you see all this blue? Blue is bad. B is B and B. That blue is bad. Blue means scarred. All right? And uh, these slides come from a paper that's been admitted as Exhibit 4. It's by uh, Dr. Burke. That's called the Burke Paper. If you want to look at it, you can. These pictures are actually in the very back of that paper. So you'll see in the back of the paper this exact slide that we're talking about here. But the point here is that when they looked at the Loma Linda patients, Mr. Yu and everybody else, they have found that there's a 66% chance, if you drink real water, that you have a permanent liver injury. You have a scar inside. And remember, all we have to prove is 50.1%, the feather thing that Mr. Parker had the trouble with. <laughs> Okay, but uh, so 66% were wet, well over the burden. So all the plaintiffs in this case uh, have permanent injury. They have permanent liver scarring. All right, and this is Dr. Hudson's testimony to that effect. So that's four out of the six people that had a liver biopsy that had liver biopsies had scarring. Yes, sir. 66%. Yes, sir. More likely than not. Yes, sir. So it's more likely than not that people who drink real water in the hydrogen unit have permanent injury that they're scarred. That is possible. And there's no testimony that disputes this. They didn't call a medical expert that disputes this. This is the only testimony you have about mm -hmm. liver scarring that all the plaintiffs have. Um, turning to compensatory damages, you're going to be asked to fill in numbers on the verdict form as to compensation, compensatory damages, damages to compensate for this permanent injury and the death uh, for these seven uh, people. All right, so let's go through what happened to them real quick. Orion, that's the baby, five months old. They had to uh, send him up to Salt Lake City. Again, this is the normal. See the high end of the ALT 78, the uh, high end of the ASD 27 connection. This is what Orion had, <laughs> 1542, 2257. These are very high readings. So that's why they sent him to Salt Lake. Next one, Jim. Uh, he had the acute encephalopathy, the brain swelling, just like everybody else. Next one, Jim. Flight for life, life, flight, they call it different things. Um, sent him up there for a liver transplant because they checked him into Sunrise and uh, he wasn't doing too good. So PICU, that's Pediatric Intensive Care Unit Transfer, sent him up there on 9-15. And by there, I'm talking about the uh, Salt Lake Primary Children's Hospital, where it's a transplant center where they specialize in doing liver transplants for children. Next one, Shane. <coughs> Put on the list, uh, like they told you, uh, Camille told you, he was moved up to number one on the transplant plan list, jumped over people that had been there for, for days. Uh, she had to sign the transplant form, next gen. Here's a picture of him waiting for the transplant, next gen. Uh, this is Camille's testimony, let's hear this. And no sooner did those words leave his mouth that I look at my son, and his little jaw drops open, and his eyes kind of flutter in the back of his head, and he starts like shaking. And I go, that's not normal. The nurse turns around, she takes one look at him and goes, he's seizing. Everybody starts rushing in. It, it just felt surreal. I was in shock. Um, yelling out medical jargon, you know, need this and that milligram stack. But there was a doctor on the phone saying um, that he was a gravely ill patient. It was just chaos. Your liver stops working. This is what happens. You get a seizure. Right? That's what happened to, to him. Uh, and then Camille also told us what happened after they got up to the hospital in Salt Lake. And he's on the transplant list. They're waiting for the liver. They find one. Uh, surgery scheduled. And this is what happened. So I think when he was not training well, I mean, panic encephalopathy was getting worse. And the next step from that is coma. So that's when they, they brought him down to the pediatric intensive care unit. And this entire time, I'm, I'm trying to keep it together. I'm 
trying to put a brave face. I, I'm staving off feelings of panic and <coughs> despair and hopelessness. This is my child. You know, I have to be strong for him. I can't. I can't give in um, to defeat. But at that point, I just broke down. I, I couldn't keep it together anymore. And that's when the doctors came in, the hepatologist, the specialist, sit down with me, told me liver transplantation is what we have to do to save his life. She signed the transplant forms. The operation was scheduled. As I told you before, the next day he wakes up. It's a miracle. He's starting to get a little better. They didn't have to do the transplant. He's living now in Green Valley. He's five years old, just started school. But for the next 60 years of his life, he's got a permanent scar in his lip. That's his permanent injury. Um, next is Mr. Yu, which I talked about just briefly a minute ago. Mr. Yu, again, he's the one that they went in and they did the biopsy because these, these just didn't come down. Okay, they stayed up. You know, you saw the normals I showed you. These, these stayed up for 13 days. So the doctors went in there and they stuck the needle in and they pulled the tissue out of the liver and they tested it and they found the permanent scarring. So there's no dispute that Mr. Yu has permanent uh, scarring. Um, 13 days of hospitalization. Uh, this is what he told you on the stand. The doctor was saying that uh, they had to keep me there longer to stabilize my condition. Um, so every day, every, yeah, every day I felt like I was dying, so when I go to the restroom, look in the mirror, I didn't recognize myself. Um, you know, it was painful. And um, it, it, uh, it wasn't me as what the doctors were telling me. You know, there's moments of time when I was thinking about like, you know, I'm going to die when I die home. Bautiz. Mr. Bautiz is back there. He's a pretty shy guy, as I told you before. Uh, we got him up on the stand, and we found out one thing. He doesn't like hospitals. Okay, I don't blame him. I've seen a lot of hospitals. I can't say I endorse their experience. Uh, but this is what happened to Mr. Ortiz. His ALT, especially his AF. Look at that AST reading. 6640. Okay? That is... Amazing, unbelievable. The regular is 34 and he's at 6640. I don't know if that's 200 times or what, but uh, so uh, next one, please, Shane. I went to someone in the hospital, they wanted to admit me, but like I said, I was aware. Um, Maria, was that you? Yeah, I do now. Thank you. I went to someone in the hospital, they wanted to admit me. But, like I said, I was worried, I was scared. It was COVID going on, so I'm like, I'm attaching all that. You got to stay 10 to 14 days away from everybody. So I'm like, okay, if they admit me, I'm going to be here at least two weeks. So I, I left. You know, I was, I was still sick, but I just, I just left because I didn't want to get admitted.
she stayed down to UCLA waiting for the transplant, and then like Orion, she starts getting better. You know, like I said before, you drink the good hospital water, you might get a little better. Um, but look, at the, this, this is the highest AST we had of any patient or any one of the plaintiffs. 7165. It was even higher than uh, Mr. Bautista's. Uh, but I, I know it's not a contest, but it, it indicates how extremely ill these people were. Uh, and this is where what Mrs. Arnone was, and that's why they popped her in the plane, sent her down to UCLA. She had all the problems, uh, uh, the typical problems, uh, you know, the brain swelling. And, uh, <coughs> uh, you know, she starts getting better at UCLA, but they keep her down there for like three or four weeks, an outpatient. And again, she's got the permanent scar in your liver. You can't see it, but she's got it just like everybody else. Um, next one, please. And how long were you at the UCLA Medical Center? About a week. Okay. And eventually you were released from UCLA? Uh -huh. Yes, that's correct. Okay, and, what, and at that time, how were you feeling when you were released from the hospital? Not 100%, not fully recovered, but <clears throat> they said I was no longer a candidate for the transplant, so I would be discharged. So she's on the liver transplant list. They didn't move her to number one because of her age, uh, like Orion, but she was on the liver transplant list for three or four days. She gets better. They discharge her. Uh, turning to Mrs. Ryerson. Kathy Ryerson, again, she's a nurse. She moved to Las Vegas when she retired to be with her sisters. Uh, she's hospitalized for a total of 21 days, two separate occasions. Uh, acute liver failure. She died on November 11, 2020. Uh, died from acute liver failure. That's a picture of her in the hospital. Not good. That's your death certificate, liver failure. There's the date of death on it, 11-11. The doctors had no idea what was causing this catastrophic shutdown. I mean, there were teams of doctors that would make their own at the ICU daily. And I would stay there and listen to them. You know, everybody from the nutritionists to physical therapists to doctors and nurses. And they would look at their chart and they were just shaking their head. They had no idea what was wrong, how to treat it. The one thing that they were certain of was that she was uh, in liver failure. That's Judy Ryerson, one of the two sisters who testified. Uh, Excuse me, that's Pat Sutherland. This is Judy Ryerson. Go ahead. Yes, this is when she was in cardiac ICU. They, they had to start doing um, kidney dialysis. And then we had to start taking fluid off her belly because her liver wasn't absorbing and handling her bodily fluids right. I don't know what. You call it, but she was very bloated. She was very sedated here as well. Um, so I can't really speak to her awareness, but she seemed to be aware when we played music, when she's when certain people were talking to her. We talked to her all the time, held her hand. Um, but she was chemically comatose right here. They had to put her into a coma. After a couple days, they had to put her into a coma. And then But she made it more than she understood what I was on the Nothing more, nothing more that could be done for her. So they transferred her <coughs> over to the hospice. And this is the testimony um, about what happened at the hospice. But she made it more than she understood what I was saying. And I said, Kathy, your liver's failing. You're having brain seizures. Your kidneys are also failing. And you have severe pneumonia, probably from the ventilation. But you have pneumonia. And I said, it's time for you to go home to mom and dad. 
because we don't know what to do to help you. And she sobbed these two big, huge sobs like you do when you, when it's kind of a shock cry. Didn't cry, but I could tell she really reacted to this. And I could tell that she was on a heart monitor and her adrenaline went up a little bit and her heart started racing a little bit. And I said, what do you want? What do you need? And so I wrote some things down on a board because I didn't know if she could understand I was grasping myself. And I said, you know, do you want this? Do you want this? And I said, do you want medicine? And she said, she nodded her head, yes, yes. It was very clear that she wasn't ready to go, at least in my eyes. She wasn't ready to go, and she really wanted to help. She wasn't ready to die. She wanted to help. All right, the verdict form has um, a session to fill in. Okay, can we have that, please? Uh, okay, up just a little bit. We have five. All right, five. Okay. Fill in the amount of damage. Let's go to six. Okay, so this is it. This is all you're going to get on damages. You don't have to go through a number of categories. It's not a checklist. You know, do, 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 do. It's just one number. You just got to fill in one number. Uh, You've got to fill in one number for each of the seven people that had acute liver failure. And then there's uh, uh, three spots for the heirs of Kathy Ryerson and two spots for the parents of uh, uh, Ryan Galbert. So let's start with uh, Orion Galbert. Okay, what we're going to suggest to you, and you know, I mean, there is no guidance. Okay, I can't hand you a table and say, okay, go down the table and point this way and see it that way. That's not how it works, okay? You have to make the decision. The judge read you a jury instruction. Uh, we are fortunate in this case because we do have a little bit of guidance here. We have a baseline. Uh, and the reason I say that is Mr. Jones, if you remember, William Jones, he testified, he got acute liver failure, and I asked him whether or not he thought $10 million would be fair compensation for his injury. And this is what he said. And it says, the next sentence it says that debilitation of liver failure, I have been to hell and back. Tell me that yeah, it was a very uh, terrible experience. Okay. If you were to go through this again, if I gave you 10 million bucks, would you? So, this is our baseline, the 10 million. And again, he's the executive vice president of Real Water. He went through this exact same thing, hell and back. Wouldn't want to do it again. The only difference between Mr. Jones and the other patients are up the plaintiffs. Is Mr. Jones does not have a diagnosis of permanent injury. He doesn't have permanent scarring on the liver, at least that we know of. He wasn't put on a transplant list. Uh, he wasn't flown to Salt Lake like Orion or UCLA like Mr. Um, or like Mrs. Arnone. Uh, he didn't spend 13 days in the hospital. Okay. <coughs> so what we would suggest is that this is the baseline, and we would suggest raising it 40% to 14 million for each plan. That's what we would suggest. That's that I'm giving you the reasoning, okay? And we think that adjustment is is uh, appropriate, given that all the plaintiffs were sicker than uh, Blaine Jones. So if, if if he thinks his injuries were 10 million, uh, we think that each one of the plaintiffs should be 14 million. Now the second part is for the heirs. And before we get to Camille, let's let's go down to the Ryersons. Okay, so this this is Pat Sutherland, that's the sister, Judy is also a sister, and then the, the third member of the family is Richard Ryerson, and you have to determine what kind of compensation they should be given, 
for losing her sister. That's, that's really what it is. Uh, so we do have a little guidance in the law for this. Not much, but a little bit. And that's why the judge gave you the life expectancy instruction. Uh, here it is. Back to that. So if you're 69, that's what Kathy was when she died, you're going to live another 16 years, okay? according to these life expectancy tables. Some people may live yet yeah, less, some people may live more. Okay, but the life expectancy table says 16 years. And that's important because that is the time period that Pat and Judy have lost their sister. If this hadn't happened, and Rick, that's Rick on the top right. So, yeah. Mr. Kent. Sorry, I hate to interrupt, sir, but it appears your battery is no. low or died. May I replace those brakes for sure? Can you hear me, ladies and gentlemen? Okay. I think I can hear you. Just get close to a mic, sir. Okay. You make me do this. Okay. See, I was doing this. I got close to the mic. I'm on this. Okay. So, we have Pat and Judy, and that's Rick on the top right there. Okay. These are the three people who are on the verdict form as the survivors of Kathy Ryerson. You know, 16 years, we just uh, suggested five million. There's, there's no magic to this, okay? I mean, you can get more or less if you want. We suggest five million. Uh, flipping back up to Camille and Brian, please. Uh, Camille, you just heard her testimony. She's Brian's uh, mother. Brian's the father. We just met, suggest five million piece for them. Um, and, and like I said, there's no match to this. So that is what we would think would be appropriate compensation. Uh, and I'm ready to turn it over to Mr. Park. Mm -hmm. you know, that was the Thank you, Quinn. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.